Hi, I'm, I'm Mel Austin. I'm Professor of Ocean and Society at the University of Plymouth. Um, I'm the leader of a, blue, of, a, of a project called Blue Communities, which works across Southeast Asia. Uh, and I'm really interested in what the benefits are of the marine environment uh, for people and how we can use that to protect the environment as well. And I'm Hong Chin Go. Uh, at the moment, I'm an associate professor in the departments of Urban and Regional Planning, Faculty of Built Environment in University Malaya in Kuala Lumpur. At the same time, also that um, I'm the co-lead for the Blue Communities Program for the Malaysian Case Study. Thank you. Lovely to meet you all. Um, just. Jamie, perhaps you want to just say who you are as well, because Jamie's in the room with me. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Jamie Aerosmith. I'm a policy advisor to uh, Minister Sutherland. So great. And I, I'm, I'm Amanda, um, and I'm Minister for Science. So, and I'm really interested in in all, all, all the work that you're you're doing. So, so I, I do have a, a few questions, but uh, if that's okay, but maybe just have a free flowing conversation would be would be fantastic. And I guess, I guess the first thing is. Really, I'd love to know. You know, what what is it that uh, your project is trying to do? What what is it? Uh, what problem is it trying to to solve? Basically, as as many people know, the seas, the marine environment, provides lots of benefits for people. It provides food. It provides health and well-being, sort of through good food, but also uh, through sort of psychological benefits. It provides lots of livelihoods through fishing and tourism. Um, and we're increasingly using the seas, particularly in Southeast Asia. They're getting very crowded and very busy. And what the project is trying to do is to help people provide the tools for them to better manage their marine environment for sustainable use, uh, so that they can use it into the future, and to help them plan the use of the marine environment. So, yeah, we're building the tools to do that. Doing it in Southeast Asia, um, in four countries, uh, in Malaysia, Philippines, Vietnam and Indonesia, uh, where you know the coastal communities are very, very dependent on, on the marine environment. Um, and we try to help them think about future climate change, sustainable use, the right governance, um, and, and how to make this all sustainable, but particularly thinking, I think, in the framework of sustainable development goals. And I suspect that Hong Chin can probably ex uh, expand on that. One thing is that if we take a look on Southeast Asia and then maybe to be more specific for Malaysia is that the coastal area in Malaysia is right, we are talking about that's a lot of discontested issues. We are talking about uh, poverty, we are talking about urbanization, but at the same time also we are talking about marine ecosystem protection. And of course, in the larger picture, we are actually talking about food security issues as well. In light of climate crisis, it's no longer or climate change only. And I remember that it just uh, bring me to the quotes that by Peter Thompson, uh, the United Nations Special Envoy for the Ocean. He mentioned that ocean science supported by capacity development is essential not only to inform SDG 14, but also other SDGs that have ocean dimension. And of course, this has been mentioned only right recent years. We started our projects right two years before this. And I'm so glad that we started with that thoughts already during that time. And as um, I mentioned earlier, being an urban planner, I really interested uh, looking at the interface of development as well as conservation in coastal region because this is really a concepted, um, contested region at the moment. That sounds quite a, a massive project that you're, you're talking about. I mean, where, where, where do you start? I think where we started is, is by bringing lots of different research disciplines, science disciplines together. So we've got natural science, which includes, you know, what is the ecology, uh, what are the, how does the ecosystem work to provide what we call the services, the fish, the flood protection, the mangroves, how does that all work interactively? Um, what's, what's the future of climate change going to be? How do we best monitor it using things like e-tools, like remote sensing? But at the same time, we bring that alongside things like governance. How do we understand uh, how we've got to where we are in terms of the governance of the marine environment and where we want to get to? What does the future look like? What do the public 
the stakeholders, the policy makers, the managers want in the future. Um, and, and how do the public understand and perceive the marine environment? So we bring in psychologists as well, and a certain amount of economics. So we've got social science, economics, governance, natural science all coming together. So we're bringing in lots of different perspectives of different types of science together. And we kind of started out with everybody working slightly independently. And, and as the project's gone on, I think people have realized um, just how interactive all of these sections, these, these different disciplines are, and why they're so important if we're actually going to help the communities that are so dependent on the marine environment to understand how to make better use of their marine environment in a more sustainable way. So how many of you are there doing this project then? Is it, is it just one person who sees it all, or how does it work? Okay, so there's me and the project manager overseeing it. We've got 10 partners, which is uh, three academic institutions in the UK and four universities in Southeast Asia, plus four NGOs. At our last annual meeting, I think we had about 120 people join us, so that's the sort of scale of the numbers of people, researchers involved. A lot of it is building capacity, particularly in Southeast Asia and the universities, but also in the UK, of how to work and look at these different pro pro problems, um, you know, from the perspective of the people who actually have to live these problems. Yeah, and and do, what 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 are the so what are the main uh, problems that you you've identified? Then what's what's top and second and third? I think so. What Mel have mentioned, I think that is, that has been a great leadership in this project of this size. And then when it triggered down right to the case study level, what we really learned about this project is not only about the scientific research, but it's also about data management, institutional uh, capacity building, and all these are entangled and embedded together within a nexus. For instance, in the context of Malaysian case study, it is called the Tun Mustafa uh, Park, located on the Borneo Island, and it is about like um, one million hectares. So we are talking with, uh, we have been engaging with different stakeholders at the state level, at the district level, and at the local levels as well. I mean, I, I'm just interested in what you've identified because I mean the project sounds really fascinating. It's great to hear about it. Yeah. What have you identified? What 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 have you? You know, what are the results of the project? Um. The finding now is that I would say it's still the initial findings is that uh, we don't see poverty as poverty. We don't see conservation as conservation and also the human well-being. So now we are actually looking at the nexus of poverty, conservation, as well as human well-being. And then for the human well-being, it has been very obvious, especially during the pandemic time. In the past, for instance, right, in Sabah, it is one of the poorest states, right, in Malaysia. A lot of financial aid has been given, has been actually allocated, but it's still poor. And that is where that we start looking at poverty is not only right just to address the poverty issue. It is about the linkage and the interactions of human who live there, the community who live there with their environment and the use and consumptions of the resources. Yeah, if I can add to that, so there's things like fisheries are, going to, are changing at the moment under climate change. So we've been able to model what fish populations are likely to benefit from where across this whole Southeast Asia region and, and which species. So some species will improve in some areas, some species will decline in some areas under climate change. So that's one example. We've got uh, results that show the network of different types of governance across these different case studies. Three of them are biosphere reserves and one is a marine protected area. And each of them evolved and developed in a different way. So it's trying to understand how those evolutions happen and how we can improve them. We're looking at the ecosystems themselves and what they provide for people. And that actually helps to inform you know, all of these different levels of governance that, that Hong Ching was talking about by making people aware that you know, mangroves provide a set of ecosystem services. They, they dampen wave action, they dampen some of the effects of climate action, uh, but they also provide nursery grounds for fish uh, and for invertebrates. 
We've used the remote sensing to really pinpoint where aquaculture is coming from. So the rather novel way um, our colleagues at Plymouth Marine Laboratory have been able to use satellite remote sensing to, to look at the proliferation of very, very small scale aquaculture developments around Palawan in the Philippines. You know, the scale of which, you know, we, we're just beginning to understand, you know, how much small scale aquaculture there is and start to think about the implications of what that small scale aquaculture is. You know, lots and lots and lots of very tiny aquaculture adds up to quite a lot of exploitation of the marine environment. How does that fit in with fisheries? How does that fit in with conservation management? When we started out the project, one of the big issues and big problems was tourism. How much tourism is sustainable, particularly in Vietnam, in Phu Lam Chan. They had sort of, I think it's around 3,000 people a day visiting a very, very small island uh, because it's a protected area and is, is, is marketed as such. You know, is that sustainable or not? Um, and that's obviously all changed during a pandemic. So some of the research has changed quite drastically from a focus on what's the carrying capacity for tourism to how can we better understand and develop the fisheries and the livelihoods in, in a time when we don't have tourism. So those are sort of some of the little kind of pinch points that you're looking at. And, and then, and then um, that, that's really helpful. And then as a result of that, how do you then exact some change? What do you do? Who do you feed that research into to then then change? I mean, I'm assuming like in the example that you just talked about, would you stop tourism? I mean, what, what's the, the plan? So that's where our partners have got fantastic relations with the different stakeholders and the different policy makers, particularly at a local level. And some of them, you know, we're trying to encourage them to look more at the kind of national level uh, and, and sort of federal level. Effectively, like, you know, we're fortunate enough in the UK to be able to sometimes get direct access to people like yourself and I are at, at ministerial level, but it's often difficult to get those messages across, you know, locally. If you're a, if you're a coastal community worker, how do you talk at a, a sort of regional or a national level to say, actually, we need to make a change to our management? Biosphere reserves are great because they actually are people and the environment, so they've already set up some of these networks. Um, give an example, I got an email on, on Sunday night from our colleague in Palawan who said that he started talking about saltwater crocodiles to the people who are concerned about conservation and management of them because what we've discovered about climate change and the change in fisheries also apparently applies to saltwater crocodiles. There's a potential that there's going to be a big, big kind of boom in saltwater crocodiles in the Philippines in this small island in, in Palawan. Implications of that, I don't know. We need to start thinking about, you know, is that a good thing or a bad thing? From a conservation point of view, um, it's good. From a local community's point of view, I would imagine there's quite a lot of trepidation about an increase in, in saltwater crocodiles, which apparently there are a lot of them in the case of the or in Sabah. So, you know, again, one of the things we've done is connect our different uh, universities and scientists across the region. So I would imagine the next concert, a conversation will be that the Philippine scientists will start talking to their colleagues in Malaysia and say, well, how does it work with saltwater crocodile populations in Sabah and what can we learn from you? And I think that's been one of the strengths of the project is, is helping people to connect and understand that they can connect not just UK to Southeast Asia, but across the different Southeast Asia projects. And I'm you know, really, really chuffed that we've helped facilitate that. And, and Hong Ching, I mean, what, what is the long term goal? What would your what would success look like in, in the future? Uh, one thing is that I think in Thun Mustafa Park, what I really see is that we are empower the youth and the women in actually trying to empower them try in doing research and also to take care of their environment. So we are not only helping them mm. to protect the environment, but we empower them. So this is something that I would say right, it is uh, to respond to the fundamental call for intergenerational sustainability. And when we talk about climate change, we are talking about, like for instance, the projection of 2050. The youth now will be the future adults. They are the ones that are going to face the consequences of climate change now. So this is some things that we see. We need it is our responsibility and commitment to equip them for that. Yeah, what we have created today or generated today. That will be something long term. Yeah. 
Yeah, and and Hong Ching on, on that. I mean, how how has the uh, the international relationship been helpful on this? You know, how has that partnership with the UK helped? Um, at the um, okay, so that will be two parts then, because we are talking about the capacity building. I really appreciate the mentorship that established within Lu communities. It's tremendous. And at the same time, it's so supportive. So we have this ECR net, early career researchers. So they, we provide them right with this safe space for them to conduct research, to voice their opinion. But at the same time, it is not only within their disciplines. We are talking about interdisciplinary and intercultural interaction. So that is really something unique. And it's not only within Southeast Asia, but also with our UK's collaborators. And at the same time, just so like we, me, for instance, I'm a medium, uh, middle, mid-career researcher. I really, I myself, I really benefited right, from this program. It is not about doing research, but the support. Yeah, uh, being a mentee to Mel, I mean, sorry, Mel, Laura, Zabina, and so many others. And that is something that I see it becomes like cross countries and it's so borderless. And I really appreciate the interdisciplinary parts because right, I think conventionally we always talk about the mentor have to be from the same disciplines. But having a mentors, many mentors from different disciplines, right, it helps to widen the perspective of see things. Yeah, and also the societal um, solution or even try to manage a group of researchers as well. So I think that is something I thought, right? Yeah, that's at the top of the list. Yeah, no, that, that, that's really helpful. And we've only, we've only got a, a couple of minutes left, but uh, I, I can sense the passion in, 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 in what you're saying. What, what, what is it that drives you to do this? Two parts then. I remember that right, someone was saying, if we see the planet, I mean, we call it planet Earth, <laughs> but the main part of the planet is actually like covered by ocean. So that is one part. And that leads to the second question, is that right? Um, what we have done on land have actually right, uh, have an influence on the oceans that we have today, the ocean health especially, and how the ocean health in return actually affecting the human health. I think this is on the larger picture because I always believe in holistic approach and integrated approach as well, being an um, urban planner. Uh, personally, I really would like to help the people. I have been working in Sabah for more than 10 years now since my PhD study and I have never failed to go back to the state except this year. Yeah, I just would like to help because that is what I believe then. Mm, yeah, it is about great. addressing the poverty issue. Yeah. I think it's the same for me as yeah. helping the coastal communities and actually seeing that we're making a difference to how they look at and manage their environment. So, so that's, yeah. that's a fantastic consequence. And as a scientist, there's always the excitement of bringing together the different disciplines to really approach a problem from a different way. I mean, as a researcher, you know, that's also, you know, part of what makes you tick is thinking about, you know, actually we have the real privilege to, to do really exciting research and at the same time to do it and use it in a way that makes a difference to people's lives, their health and the environment they live in. You know, hey, what could be better? Absolutely. <laughs> just a point, yeah. maybe uh, just a point also try to emphasize is that I think sort of working in UK, uh, collaborators uh, on ocean research is just marvelous. The main reason is also that despite of the, uh, the geography distance, mm -hmm. but we are talking about the geography of UK itself. That's right, you know, with the long coastline, a lot and tremendous, uh, I mean, research that have been done regarding ocean and also the interactions of human and ocean and this is something that we really learn in this project yeah, yeah really have no, it's been an absolute pleasure to to meet you both and thank you so much for your time i don't know where the time's gone actually <laughs> just, uh, yeah, <laughs> but an absolute pleasure